Okay. <coughs> All right. So I admit everybody in. Morning, everyone. It's a lot of people coming in. I hope you're having a good Friday morning. It's quite sunny today versus yesterday, which was quite wet. Lah. Was it raining the whole day for you yesterday, Eric? For me, it was half the day. Lah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think the whole night was raining. Now it's okay. But it's feeling a bit uh, cold, right? Chilly, which is great. Yeah, Crazy. very nice. Breezy weather. Okay, so we've got more people coming in. We'll give it another minute or so before we start because I think people are just trickling in. There's more than 100 people coming in today. I think the limit is 100. Yep. So hopefully we will be able to start in another minute or so. Uh, hey, morning, morning, morning. You can unmute now and say hello just as long as before we start the uh, event itself, then you will ask you to mute. But for now, you want to say hello to Eric. Please go ahead. Say hi, Eric. Hi, hi, Eric. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Morning, a morning. Of, a lot of familiar faces today. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum. Morning, morning. We have a lot of people today like, from different different companies, which is good to see this. Uh. Good morning. Okay, la. Morning, 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 Zadi. Morning. Okay, la. I think I think to be fair, and we've got a lot of questions and discussion points to raise with Eric today. We will start now, and whoever's coming after that, we will allow them to sort of trickle in. La. So thank you everybody for attending. Today's blitz scaling session with obviously everybody knows Malaysia's first and only tech unicorn, Kasim, with the founder and CEO Eric Cheng. I've got a lot of questions for Eric today, um, and the questions we're going to be asking is a bit different, right? So you've heard most of the stuff that Eric's done on the press because I, I think none of you are strangers to to how Eric has grown the business over the past few years. Um, so we're going to start with a very interesting set of very personal questions with Eric. I hope you don't mind, huh? <laughs> okay, so. Eric, there's this very interesting story that you, you, you told us before that in school, and I'll, I'll get to the school part later, why it's very important. In school, you were known as David Copperfield, right, in SMBJ. Now, why, why was that? Yeah, because I, I, <laughs> I skipped school a lot, right? So people couldn't find me. And after a while, that kind of just stick to me, right? Like, you know, for one moment, you see Eric and the other session that you don't see him anymore. <laughs> that's, that's, that's how I got that name. Yeah. Which is the subject you skip the most, lah? Ah, I think almost every subject. <laughs> <laughs> almost every subject. Yeah, yeah. And the people, the, the school hates me for that. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So, so we discussed this, right? So you went to SMBJ, which you spent, I assume, form one to form five in SMBJ, which is which is an amazing school where there's a lot of entrepreneurs or people involved in the tech space came out of there. Um, I'm just curious, right? So. Do you do you see the value of being in, in, in a public school at that time growing up, you know, building a lot of you as an as an entrepreneur? Did you did you find a lot of your entrepreneurial drives when you were in high school or did you find that later in life? Um I actually found it like you know after I started working. Um I think throughout my whole uh, journey when it comes to studying in school or whether it's in college, um I, I think it's part of my mistake, the, the kind of courses to I enroll in that doesn't interest me at all. So, you know, when, when, when you are studying something that you don't like, right, it just somehow just hits you as something like you want to learn and, and have the curiosity to learn further, right? So that actually started after I, I had my first job, <clears throat> um, which is a digital media industry. Uh, it's a firm that does all the uh, um, um, at our work uh, between the region. Uh, but I think in school, you know, in, in most of the cases, it, it wasn't the case that I was already very un entrepreneur. Um, I have that thinking. I think, I guess, um, be, even during college time, right, I wanted to start something. But, um, you know, wasn't really uh, the, the main driver, right, for me to, to kickstart until I started working. So, so the first job you mentioned is not really a job because that's your own company, right? You started your own media company. That was the first. Oh, no, no, yeah. So, so that's the first job. Yeah. So, so I oh. went into the. So, the, the the story is, you know, I graduated from high school. I went into accounting. Um, I, I did not um graduate because I didn't see myself to become an accountant eventually. Um, and I was very fortunate to land a job in uh, the, the the company is called Unity. It's a digital media firm. Um, it was two thousand eight. I still remember. 
and it was really interesting, right? Because uh, the industry of ads uh, back then, advertising was being disrupted by digital marketing. So things yeah. like Facebook, Google started to come up. Um, and I was at the forefront of that. So I think <clears throat> the whole uh, responsibility, my scope was to uh, help educate clients, um, you know, help, uh, helping them understand how this is measurable and so on. So I think that disruptive mindset kind of kickstart from there. And it, it, it got got it caught my attention, right? My interest, right, in, in everything uh, that, that was very disruptive from there on. So I think um, that job actually shaped me to who I am today in many ways. Um, and, and it gave me a, a good foundation to, to, to start. And you stayed with Unity for quite a while, right, Eric? I think, what, eight years was it? Yeah, I think in total eight years. Um, I actually, you know, in between started two companies and I went back uh, before I started Carson. So, um, and, and I think my 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 boss of that firm is also my mentor, uh, Fabian, oh. though he's, he's the founder of that firm. And, you know, he, he all the while known me as someone that is, you know, always wanted to go out and start my own venture. Um, and, and rightly so, after three, four years in, um, I, I, I came out to start a similar and our company that remodel Invite Media in the US, uh, which they were acquired by Google. So Invite Media now is being called GDN. Uh, so I think you're very familiar with it. Um, and and uh, you know back then when I, as it was 2012, you know I saw it like you know there's no one doing it in Southeast Asia, and we need to have one that is Southeast Asia owned, right? So started that company. Um, eventually sold it after like uh, I think a year in the business. Um, and went on to start a mobile game studio, uh, which was interesting because I like games. Uh, I used to play games competitively. Uh, Especially Warcraft? Uh, yeah, I'm more like FPS percent Counter-Strike. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so, so uh, almost representing the country to do that. Uh, cool. but, but yeah, it wasn't the right era to be an e-gamer back then. <clears throat> but ultimately, you know, it, it also uh, uh, interests me, right, when I saw the app industry was booming. Um, and like Candy Crush, uh, Supercell with a Clash of Clans. So I thought to create something that, uh, that that I can have my own mobile game studio. So I, I published two games, uh, oh. you know, made some money, but just, just didn't have enough creative just to create a third one and kind of just shut it down. Um, and, and then I went back to the company, right, to continue uh, another one to two more years um, before I had the idea to start Carson. So so you basically took a sabbatical. So you didn't... You didn't run both companies or in that case three right because you mentioned one was the, the the game development company were you running at the same time we took a sabbatical from unity and did these two startups um i actually quit the company for a while so oh, you could start those two ventures um before you know i, I don't have any more ideas um and, and i kind of just uh, went back to the same company because we, they, they were also looking for uh, a person to fill out the position and still waken um and i just you know went back uh, to the help that yeah Actually, that's very interesting, right? Because a lot of people are worried, right? When you become an entrepreneur, and everybody here, mostly, I think, ninety percent of entrepreneurs, right? Is the worry that if I either fail or I exit the business, where do I go after that? In your case, you were fortunate, right? Your, you mentioned your mentor was your boss, who basically would say, "Okay, Larry, you can come back." Right? I assume that's how that conversation happened. Otherwise, where would you be going, right? That's a big question. Would that be what you would say was was one of the good things with Unity? Yeah, I think uh, we, we click very well, right? In, in many ways, he, he knows that I can contribute to the business um, and I haven't found anything that interests me back then to, to, to start something. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's, there's also need for, for me to, to really, you know, um, find something um, that I can work on before I can have uh, like another idea to start, kickstart an adventure. I think the, the agreement is that I will always go back to the same cycle to start uh, another, the next venture, right? I think that that has been a clear understanding between myself and, and uh, the, uh, yeah, the person who hire me. So uh, that, that kind of just uh, naturally comes uh, in the end. That's extremely supportive. I'm sure when you told him again, hey, I'm leaving to start Castle, you'd be like, oh, again, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, all the best. Yeah, maybe you'll come back again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that ain't looking like it's happening. But okay, so that's the story of Eric as, as how you carved yourself as an entrepreneur. And it seems as though you are very much an entrepreneur since at the very even beginning of your career. It's always it's always been nipping at the heels of doing something on your own, right? It's 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 probably inbuilt inside you, right? So now let's let's get to a more detailed question. So now you've left Unity and you're going to start Castle. What is the story? Here's a guy who, yes, you founded two companies, semi-successful. You're going into a business, you have absolutely no idea, from my understanding. You don't you don't really have any, you know, used car background or in that matter or in that matter any automotive background and you're going to a business completely alien where are you going to find money 
No, I think uh, I think to, to to start off with that, like how we got to the idea, right? Um, is similar to how uh, I started the first and second venture. So I think for for us, it's very clear from day one. Like we don't need to know the industry very well. We need to know like what's happening in that industry rather. Um, and I think we, we, we saw that there's a lot of pain points in the market um, and especially in automotive, right? So, <clears throat> and it's not about um, getting exposures, like, you know, getting people interested to be buying a car or selling a car, but rather the whole frictions between the process of buying and selling, you know, that's, that's where people usually have nightmare-ish uh, experience. And I think um, you, you don't need to be a car expert to do that, right? I think you need to be able to find out, like, do you, are you able to, uh, to the market and I think that's that's something that's you know how the disruptive mindset came into the picture right like it was just through a conversations that we have I remember it's a coffee shop between myself and my co-founder uh, we both talk about how bad the experience is when it comes to buying and selling parts um, they say hey like you know like is there the existing uh, solutions that can tackle this like no one is doing it no platform uh, why don't we do why don't we create something that that can help people benefit uh, from this because we will be the first customer and we, we saw a lot of other people around us also have similar thinking, right? When you ask for the, you do a quick survey, ask for the experience, it's always bad. Yeah. Um, and I think that prompted you to come up with a better solution, right? And, and I think what's more interesting is how do you utilize the better solutions to create a, a, a business um, that, that not just make the people better off, right? But at the same time, also you're able to generate income and, and make it a sustainable business model. So, and I think that takes a bit of time for us to fine tune. Um, and, and of course, we are very fortunate also to have investors help along the way to uh, help us test different uh, um, model, right? What we could work on um, and eventually land that on the customer that you see today. No, but, but I'm not going to let you go so easily on that one, Eric. I want to deep down further. Like, okay, so you got the idea. You and JT were talking about it at the coffee shop, right? And then from that idea, obviously there's some bootstrapping involved at the beginning, right? Your own money coming out, trying to do some kind of MVP, I would assume. I won't go there early. Lah. So then, okay, you got the idea. Okay, now it's time for me to go and speak to investors. Do you know anyone to speak to at the time? Did you pick up a phone and call three or four investors you already knew or you started from zero? <laughs> uh, started from zero for sure. It's like, you know, I came from an advertising industry, not from an investment industry. So I know no one uh, when it comes to the investors. Uh, but I think we, we know, you know, this is uh, a business that can become really huge, right? So, um, and I think what we did was we went the hard way uh, with no contact, no understanding, no network in the, the, the venture capitalist uh, network. We, we went on to, you know, uh, do a lot of cold emails, right? Uh, reach out to many investors. Um, and it was really tough, right? Like, I mean, we, we, we know nothing about how to create a good pitch deck. Um, then we seek for advice. You know, some people help us along the way, uh, which are some, some of them also in the Endeavor network, like Chain, I have my money, uh, and so on. So, and I think, uh, um, you know, the, the moment where we get to the investors, we, we started pitching and all, but it wasn't really always successful. Um, I'll give you an example, right? During the seed round, when we raised our, our uh, first round of 350,000 uh, US dollar investment, I think it took us about 60 over uh, uh, pitches, you know, from, from 60 over investors, right? And all of these investors either reach to info at xxx.com to, to, you know, somehow, you know, we got the contact from someone who's interested, right? So, and it was really tough because up until the very, very last investors that we spoke to, we only have one investor out of the 60 committed, right? So it was a very uh, uh, difficult journey. Um, but but we, we kind of went through it, right? We, we are very persistent, um, very pers we persevere all the way to, to get to that stage. And I think that the last meeting that we got was really interesting. Um, I was presenting to a group of his portfolio companies as well. Um, and, and eventually when <clears throat> he, he got interested in the idea and then invest a check to us, we concluded the round. Um, you know, it was an amazing fit because for us, it's after six, seven months in the business, we've been using all our money bootstrapping. Um, and we went to this path to fundraise because we see a big opportunity, right? How we can create a, a really uh, huge platform, huge company out of this. And, um, you know, I'm really fortunate to see how we can uh, get that two investors in for the, the first round. Yeah, with no contact. That's amazing. You mentioned you did six, seven months of your own bootstrapping. Did you and your co-founder talk to yourself, look, by month 11, if we don't get money, we close shop. Did that even cross your mind? Like there must have been a threshold, right? A limit. Yeah, I think uh, that 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 was some of the plan B that we have, right? By the time that the injection came in, 
um, we were already almost running out of money. So, but I think that the thinking behind is we, we believe that business is doing something great, right? We, we see the monetization coming in, tractions is picking up, it's, it's like a very nice hockey stick um, in the beginning. So um, we, we just needed that, that, uh, that that was right. Uh, the watches for us to continue uh, to bridge to the next milestone, um, and and I think we were ready to to uh, also have some capital injections from our friends and family in the case of the next couple of months we still don't get something out of it. Um, but but yeah, there's always a plan B, plan C, plan D. We, we try to activate um, um, and while you continue to work for the most ideal situation, the most ideal goal, right, uh, for the company. Okay, so so now now you mentioned right. So so knowing that okay like worst case scenario you've got plan B as you mentioned. So closing was never part of it like you didn't want to talk about it like that 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 is a sort of edge that you want to you want to look over right. So so now that you've closed, you mentioned your investors, your first two investors. Then you're scaling even further with uh, Watches. But three hundred fifty thousand dollars in your business may seem like a lot for a lot of other companies, but in your particular business, which is cash intensive, you knew you're going to raise the next round very very soon. So when do you know when is the next round required? And, and what were your key metrics you were looking at to say, look, now it's time, we're ready to race, let's go to the market and raise money for, for your Series A or, or bridge round? Yeah, yeah. So I would say we always have that map out already. Um, even though, you know, it, it seems like uh, we're almost running out of money uh, and need to close the company down, right? But the thinking behind that round is to carry us through for the next um, six to 12 months gap, right? I, I think we have that. Um, uh, map out in a in a projection um how we want to proceed with the use the, the money uh that we will be raising to the uh the things that we will be investing in so i think um that's already a clear path to how much this would re uh, require uh, how much this is uh, um um would be utilized in the next couple of months or next couple of quarters and when do we need to go out to raise so um that's something that we discussed quite intensively uh, uh with the team which um, I think the second round came in about uh, six to nine months later after wow. the first round. So, um, and, and we wasn't always, uh, we weren't always on the road, right? Like fundraising and all, right? We just meet investors and, and so on and, and talk about the company. But I think the, to the actual fundraising, it would kind of happen, uh, the second round was about three to four months before. So, so there's always time for you to kind of measure like when do you want to uh, spend your time in growing the business while we go for fundraising. Um, and and we, we didn't go out to race and then we just say like let's let's just let's just see how things goes before we race another round. We already have a clear understanding of when would the next round be. Um, I think that helps you to plan better, right? And and also how to use your capital more efficiently. I think having that that laser focus in terms of okay, by month four, we're gonna start raising and before that, just don't bother us. I'm only focusing on the growth metrics, right? That requires you to have a team that at, at the very least at the beginning people you can trust to achieve these metrics, right? So how do you, especially for the scale-up people who are coming in today, the companies are coming in today, you're at that early stage. How do you hire people at that stage, knowing that number one, of course, you don't have the budget to hire the best guys at the beginning. And secondly, how do you then ensure that these guys stay for the duration as you're building this business? Because it's very volatile at the beginning. Yeah, sure. So I think it's, it's a lot about finding out what's your impact area, right? So I, if you, I recall back like during the first or second year, um, a lot of my role, my responsibility is kind of crossover, um, wearing multiple hats. Um, and I believe that a lot of the people within the team also would, would, would uh, say the same thing. Like they are at the same time running HR, but they're running the ops and sales, um, a little bit of marketing and product and so on. So I think we, we have that clear distinction of like maybe from the get-go, you know, these are the three or four things that you'd be doing. Um, you're, you're responsible with, with the KPIs especially. Um, and the, the, all the different IPs that you're going to run, right? And then uh, I will be doing the next couple of things that is not on that plate. Um, and you kind of just narrow it down, right? Like there are areas that you need really strong functional hits. You know, there are areas that um, you need expertise, uh, that, that dominant expertise when it comes to uh, running it more efficiently. So um, you can't do it all. You don't have all the capital in the world. So you need to be able to be selective, right? What are the, the drivers when it comes to moving the needles in the next couple of quarters? So I think that's, that's where we decide on what kind of people to hire, right? Like I, I didn't imagine my, ourselves needing a CFO from the get-go because um, that's not an area that would really be super impactful to us since um, you know the, the kind of uh, finance control and all is quite <clears throat> uh, strong in, internally and external fundraising was mostly done by me. So you, you see that that's not a clear need there, but we have a clear need when it comes to having a, a strong CTO. So that's something that we, we went on to start because 
we want it we want the growth to be more product led to, to be more technology led right so and and then that when the uh, platform become more robust more scalable as we go for the 3x 4x growth so you know that then that people that you hire in those early stage it, it makes sense um, and it also, uh, you know, comes to something that can be impactful, right? Once you hire them on board, it's not just there for, for completing the team's uh, org structure. Okay, that's very interesting, right? Because usually you think, okay, I need a CMO now, I need a CTO. Okay, CTO, obviously, if it's a tech company, usually that's something we won't argue. When do I hire a CMO or when do I hire a CFO? Do I need to hire a specific operations person if you can't do ops, right? But, but walk me through the fact that as the team was scaling, right? Now, now the problem is the team is potentially alien, right? Maybe you and your co-founder, you're very familiar and then the team is almost all new or maybe one or two friends you brought in potentially, right? That's what people do with startups. It's very lonely at the top, Eric. As you're scaling the business, there are more harder days than there are good days, especially at the beginning. How do you know when to share certain things to your core management team and when not to? Like, how do you manage that stress at the beginning? Um, <clears throat> I think we are a very transparent bunch. So I think in many ways, uh, we practice that so that, you know, uh, people would know what's the latest in the company, what we're doing, where we're heading to, and what's our game plan, right? So uh, that, that's something that I always uh, preach uh, within the company so so that the, the, the culture stay intact, right? People share the same vision and trying to work on an objective and not trying to overlap with the, the things that they're doing on a day-to-day. Um, and I think having that vision to tie them all together is, is important. So um, I think my role is always to be able to hold everyone into one standard that is um, um, similar across the board. And this standard has to be high. So you're not going for like a 10, 20% growth. You're going for, let's say, 2x, 3x growth. How do you achieve that? <clears throat> and, and based on what you're doing in a company, you need to be able to map your way back to, to that, right? So which in the recent years, we introduced OKR in the business. And that's very helpful because you're not tying them based on one KPI or two KPIs. They will not understand very much how this will contribute to the business as much as they think they're doing a very good job by meeting the KPI. But yep. um, having an OKR, it will help them to kind of just understand that how all of this contribute to that greater success of the company. Like for example, our vision is to create uh, now the most um, um, the, the largest in- integrated car e-commerce platform in yep. Southeast Asia. That is measured by the number of cars that you're selling. That's measured by the MPS code that you are creating for the company. That's also measured by the conversion that you get through funnel to funnel. So um, when you break it down to like very granular basis, you know, uh, one inventory person, inventory lead, how he's managing the, the inventory, how does it contribute, right? So it has to be able to relate back to uh, the, the objective setting. Um, and I think that's where you can tie everyone together, right, uh, to be aligned that, you know, at the same time, you can share quite freely in terms of what are the, the challenges that we are facing, how do we overcome it. Um, I think you have a, a group of people who are really loving solving hard problems in yep. their company. You know, that is helpful. Um, and and that's, that's our hiring strategy, right? You need to find someone that's very passionate about solving these kind of problems. Um, and then... Then, then they will, you know, eventually just really do all their, uh, their, their best to, to make it happen. From what you're saying, Eric, it's a very high performance culture, which is great, which is why high performance culture equals to masterclass execution from, from yourself and the custom team. You, from what you said, you set out the company at the beginning to have the high performance culture, which, which is very, very important, especially at the nascent or early stages. How do you ensure that performance culture remains high as you grow, because when you grow, you add more people and then the culture changes based on the people you bring in. How do you ensure beyond just OKRs? Because there's the, there's the very empirical evidence side where you measure the KPI OKR and there's a very human element. You know, people start talking behind your back, gossip, you know, that. how do you manage that high performance culture and, and sustain it? Yeah, so I think having a clear side of goal is very important, right? Um, like, like for us, we've been growing quite well in the on a year-to-year basis. Like every other year, at a minimum, we achieve a, a 2x, um, if not usually 3x of the growth before. So I think if you look at it on, on that perspective, right, people will get content very easily, right? It's yeah. like, oh, we are growing very well. I'm doing a good job and all, right? So yes, we are doing a good job. But I think we, we never lose sight of, of that one single goal we are trying to reach, right? Um, and, and that one single goal is, are we the market leader today? Um, and are we capturing the larger portion of the entire market share? So what we always talk about in the business is there is a $60 billion market they are in right now, right? As much as we are considered the market leader in the digital space, um, that is only 1 billion out of 60. So what is stopping us to reach like the next three, four, five, and even 10% of the market share? 
and and how how much of a time frame that we need to spend in order to get there. So, and I think to to give you a very large number from the get go, it feels like what unreachable. It feels like reaching for the moon, yeah. reaching for the yeah. stars, right? But I think once you you have that ready, and then you kind of just um 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 design the the way back. How do you reach a path in order for you to get there? Then things become a lot clearer. So then it it, make, it makes every day the things that you're doing meaningful, that you are contributing with that, you are getting closer to that gap, right? <clears throat> so and I think ultimately that's how we position that that uh in the in the business. We never think that it's high performance culture or whatnot. We just think that we just thought that you know this is something that we want to reach and we want to get there as fast as possible. So how do we do that? Um, so in between everything is just a process. Uh, in between is just how do we optimize and improvise to, to get there? Um, and and that's how we uh think. Um, on this well. Okay, I'll, I'll add on to what you said, right? So, so because you have a very clear objective, right? Whether it's ten percent, twenty percent of the market. So then, then naturally, you've got to decide first to scale, or obviously first to market. So, so whether it's first to market, to a large extent, Kasim was first to market, especially in the countries you were in, right? Now, in terms of scaling, now when you want to have land grab, you you know you wanna you wanna you wanna corner the market, right? Then you've got the question of which markets do you wanna dominate first, and and how fast. Do I want to expand? How do you decide? Like, okay, I'm I'm done in Malaysia in my sort of metrics. Okay, I've covered this much in terms of revenue. Now I'm ready to go to Singapore, which was your first market. How did you decide to expand your first country, knowing that Malaysia, you know, you haven't won yet, but you say, okay, I'm going to go expand now before it's too late. How do you know? I think um it it comes down to whether you're able to set up a team, right? Um, having the right person to to lead the uh, new expansions and so on. So, and I think oftentimes you can do it internally or hire someone from externally. Um, and I think more important to get yourself ready is to really understand what kind of company you're trying to build. Um, are you trying to focus, what is, is your strategy trying to focus on being Malaysia first, then only go to other countries? Or you, if, if, it, if you think that you should expand fast and be in a few countries because you're able to replicate that success very quickly. Right, so I think our approach is we we took the the the, the second option. Right, uh, we thought that this is a business that we can replicate very quickly. Um, we saw that you know customers, whether it's Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, they all face a similar pain point. They need the solution. Now, if if we are able to replicate the tech, the product, um, build the infrastructure, <clears throat> who will be the right person to start leading it and build a team around? him right or her so i think that's how we always kick start in terms of the conversations when is the right time for us to get into the market because we already know that the market is ready for it but we needed someone to be behind that um be aligned with you in terms of objective how you try to grow it uh, and be consistent and able to localize it right to the manner of yeah. how it will be run and operate in indonesia and thailand for example so and i think that that gave us the, the confidence once you already have someone in mind that is ready for uh to 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 help you build a business over there and of course it, it pre-covid time is even helpful right that you can be traveling to indonesia and thailand it's not very far from uh where, where we are um and that helps as well so then i think ultimately you, you need to set a very clear strategy like uh, which which path are you taking? If you decided on expanding, I think the timing is really uh, uh depend on whether you have you are able to find the right person or not, and to how fast you how quickly you can find the right person. It depends how aggressive you are in 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 recruiting, right? So I think it's just that we have that goal that we want to expand in, in to this country in this year. So then then you contribute you all your time, right, to try to make that happen as as much as possible. Okay, but. As you mentioned, like, okay, the 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 knowing who's going to read the country and and how you how you hire even better people, the country that's that's obviously in the scaling, you know, mantra, right? Of making sure that you are replicating what you're doing here in all these countries. What happens when, let's say, the country is a lot harder when you went in than you initially thought? Example, let's say Singapore was a tough country or or, or a tough market to crack, where it probably requires more capital to reach the same number of uh, transactions as Malaysia, or there are more discerning customers there. For example, I don't know which markets would be difficult for you, but what happens then? Right? Do you then have to step in, and how much time as CEO would you then have to say, "Look, I'm going to spend thirty percent of my time in this country," and and then how do you manage that that almost a house on fire moment, right, when all these markets are running at the same time with different problems? Yeah, I mean, trust me, man, it's never easy. You know, yeah. um, any countries is never easy. There's always things that you need to uh, look at. Um, and I think um, uh, to, to that question, right, is is you have to first identify whether you have found the right product market fit, you know, in, in those markets when you expand. Um, and I'll give you an example. Like we, we at one point started the business in, in, uh, in Australia. 
Um, we went in a couple of months and after that, we, we didn't feel it's the right market for us to launch this product. Um, and then we pull out almost immediately. So I think then you, you understand that the right time for you to pull out is when you know that, you know, even the customer don't actually need your product, right? But, you know, in, in other markets between Southeast Asia that we penetrate in, I think a lot of it when it comes to bottlenecks, issues in, in its scaling, <clears throat> you need to be able to, to know what are the reasons that these things are not moving um, as per your expectation. So, and, and always break it down to understand that what are the growth drivers um, in, the, in the business, right? Be it Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, Thailand, um, you know, what moved the needles? So then you will see that maybe some metrics that you are following is not reaching up to, uh, up to uh, the, 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 the KPI as stated. So I think then you look deeper into what's happening. Um, and from there, oftentimes you find out there are some issues here and there. It could be um, the, the people behind, um, it could be um, your, your product is not being localized to the, the, down to the level of how the people would understand it. Um, you know, you, I think localization is something that you have to do in Southeast Asia. The, the region nuances is always there, you know, um, and, and there's a very big difference in, between how you uh, iterate your product um, in the market whether it's Malaysia, Indonesia, and China. So I think that's where things become more granular in the, in the way we measure, right? Whether this market, um, what are the problems that we're facing? How do we tackle that? Um, and a lot of this can be understood through uh, analyzing more of the metrics that you see on a day-to-day. -day. And I think back to what you were saying, right? So you've got to be very granular in terms of what you do. Then it's easier for you to measure. And, and you mentioned you left Australia and that's that must have not been an easy thing, right? Now, of course, in retrospect, it was a done and one and done thing, right? Three months, you're out, right? But for a lot of founders, when you go into a market, you hope to win, right? Nobody goes to a market hoping you're going to lose, right? And that psychological take back of not just opening, you may have hired a team and now you've got to let go of this team after three, four months. And that's something that that I think requires a lot of grit. And and, and that's what I want to understand. The grit part, Eric, is very important, right? It's, it's how do you keep taking the punches and keep moving forward? Because you can't always fail, right? You can't, you can't always succeed in everything, right? It's, it's always this mix of, of success and failure. How do you keep yourself psychologically? It's okay, mm. I'll move on. I think it's fine, right? Like, you know, I, I, I feel like I've never been in, in uh, um, I, I'm never the kind of person that you envision to become like a, a leading a company like Carson, right? So, and it's, it's interesting that I come from a very humble beginning so that, you know, I see all of this adversity as part of life, right? So, and especially being in, in our position, I think um, uh, what we are trying to do is to make as many right decisions as possible. Um, and I give you an example also, I, I never had any issues in making um, an imperfection, uh, a, a decision by having imperfection, uh, imperfect informations, right? Um, uh, that I have in hand, but you just need to be quick to navigate that once this don't work out the way that uh, it seems, then um, you need to have a backup plan. Um, and I think that's where the team become very helpful because when you have a team that is able to help contribute insights, understanding on what's going wrong, what's going right, uh, it helps you make decisions a lot quicker and faster. So I think that's, that's where uh, we are able to execute so quickly um, because we're not just disciplined, but at the same time, when, when it comes to making decisions, we, we tend to do it and execute it very quickly. And something goes wrong, then we would want to uh, um, uh, activate plan B and, and plan C and so on. So it seems like you don't dwell very much on, as you mentioned, like on, on any imperfect decisions, right? So, okay, fine. It's, it's done. Move on, right? A lot of us, we look, oh, we shouldn't have done that, right? And then you go into that spiral of, had I done it better? And then you're wasting time iterating things that shouldn't be shouldn't be what you're focusing on, right? So how do you decide between what is imperfect and right for the business and imperfect and rushed? And that would lead to a string of bad decisions. That's, that's, that's very tricky, right? So there's a, yeah, there's a clear definition between big move and big bets, right? When you're not 100% you're not clear, you're not very, uh, 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 you don't have much confidence when it comes to making a decision, um, usually there's a big bet. Right, a big move is being uh, uh, you're able to quantify it. Like by 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 me doing this, I move this in the market. You know what's going to happen, right? So and then you will see the clear difference. Like making a big bet is like, for example, I just make a huge marketing investment without knowing what is the ROI, right? And then a big move is you're having very clear understanding of which segment I'm going to invest into, uh, creating exposure. Uh, do I have a target segment and what is the kind of uh, ROI impact I'm trying to uh, get in, in return, right? So then all your 
your planning, your strategy, your, the way you measure the, the success, um, you have something, you have a framework in place rather than just doing it because you feel it's right, right? That, that's, 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 that's a, a huge bet that you should not risk it. So I think um, we, we are very, uh, we, we take very calculated risk, right? Every time when we see we should do something, um, that's because we felt that the market, the timing is right. But at the same time, we also want to make sure that we, we optimize the result of that. Um, and I think that, that goes back down to uh, very intensive planning before you, you you launch it. So preparation is always something that I emphasize a lot in the team, right? So it's, I mean, most of the time when it comes to business, 80% of your time is, is spent on preparation. 20% of the time will be spent on execution. Um, but by the time you execute, we do not know, you know what you're going to do, you know, how do you navigate through, then it means something wrong with, with the way you prepare uh, your game plan. Um, I don't know whether you can share this, right? So, so obviously the biggest move you've made so far is catch up, right? That, that, that whole, you know, what made you a unicorn today. How much, how much time did you put, like months? Was it, how, how long did you put, mm. how much of the team involved in that sort of mega decision? Uh, not much, I guess, right? So I think, uh, we, we, yeah, not much. We, we, we honestly only spend like uh, uh, next two, three weeks, uh, sorry, two, three months, uh, starting from the first discussion all the way to what you saw on the press, right? So, and uh, it was also fortunate because on, on the other side, ICAR, was, well, oh, ICAR is welcoming uh -huh. this idea to integrate as well. And I think uh, the, 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 the visions that we see two platforms joining together is something that internally um, and even on the iCraft side, we, we see this happening and, and we see this becoming a much larger platform, much larger ecosystem. So um, we, we, we didn't, I mean, a lot of people within the organizations that are aware of the, the progress, but not completely involved in the process of what are the things that we want to do. So, and I think more, more, of our discussions during that time with Ketcha is really about what are the synergies that we can quantify, we can reflect, right? Or what kind of ecosystem we're trying to create and how does it help the business? Um, how does it help the, the customer better off? And I think those things, once, once we have it ready and we say it makes sense and this is going to be something really exciting, that's when we start getting into the details and how do we make this uh, deal happen, right? Um, and then, yeah, things come pretty naturally from, from there on because, you know, you have two teams working on one single goal um, and, and trying to reach there as soon as possible. And, and then the deals just got to us very quickly. That's amazing. Of course, now you're in a journey that I think most of the people on the call today may not be able to read, like, which is assimilating almost two separate cultures and companies together, right? So that will be your next challenge, I suppose. Is it even a challenge, Eric? Sorry, the challenge of the, the, of of basically Catcher and and Custom, two different sort of companies, right? Now coming together as one big group, would the simulation yeah. be something of a challenge, or is it a challenge at all? You think? Uh, it's, I, I think it's a good challenge to have. Uh, it's a good challenge to have uh, because we all embrace it, right? We see this platform to be beyond just being like custom as what you are seeing today. We, we see ourselves moving to a direction that we want to become the Amazon for cars uh, or the super app, right? Like that you can do everything uh, from buying, selling, insurance, finance and everything else, right? So, um, and, and, and to, to, to basically give you a sneak peek of uh, what's going to happen, uh, it, it goes beyond just custom combining with like iCar, there are a couple of other things that we're working on right now would eventually to be part of this whole ecosystem. Um, and it's going to be a lot, a lot larger, a lot bigger. So I think our ultimate goal is to be able to digitalize the entire process of uh, car ownership. So, and I think when, when, when we talk about that um, with the, the partners that we are engaged with, they're all very excited. You know, they see that this is going to be something that they want to use uh, even for their customers. Um, and then now then, you know, it comes down to, you know, what we're going to do, right? how do we take part of this? Um, and, and, and then the discussion just started from, from, from there. Yeah. I mean, today, Eric, you are now a beacon for a lot of entrepreneurs. You're not every entrepreneur who's on this call looking at one day, maybe I'll be Eric, right? That's, that's the dream because you've, you've basically made a mark in Malaysian entrepreneurial system, right? So we've got another six more minutes before we take the questions, which are a lot. Um, I've got one last question for you before we start taking, I think, some of the chat and some that's been asked via email. My last question for you, Eric, is this, right? Personally, if you could tell the story of Kasim, right? You're, you're done, you're retired, you exit, right? Spec, settle, you're retiring on a beach somewhere, right? If there was one single greatest accomplishment, that you could say, look, this is what I did right as Eric. Just down to one thing, like, what would it be to get you today? It could be the team, it could be the right investors. What was the one thing you said that if this didn't come in at the right time, I wouldn't be who I, I am today? 
Well, it's definitely the people, right? The, the success of Carson is not down to me, right? I, I think the only job that I did was to really tie everyone together um, and get uh, everyone to be excited with the goal, the vision, and keep working day to day on it, right? Um, I, I think the 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 biggest achievement, uh, the satisfaction that I got by building this company throughout the last six years and for the many years to come, um, is really I'm I, I'm able to assemble a team, right, of people who share the same belief, want to see the same outcome eventually, um, and I, I think that that culture has been something that I'm I'm pretty proud of, because ultimately I think. I look back at my journey, right? Like with with a lot of help of the mentors, uh, you know, they also give me the advice to get to where I am right now. So, and I think having this this group of people at the same time um, being in the company right now, benefiting from the experience and scaling the the company to somewhere that no one has reached before, you know, this is something that we, we I feel really proud of at the same time. And I feel that you know this is the the more this is the part that make me feel the the richest, right? That you know there are people who are, you know, you know, really changing, uh, having a life-changing experience by taking part of this journey. And um, and I guess that, that kind of just, you know, shaped me to how I think about, um, not just Endeavor as an organization, but how I think about, um, you know, eventually able to pay it forward. Because it's with the help of all these mentors that, you know, shaped me um, and helped me navigate through some of the obstacles and not taking uh, the wrong step as much as possible. Um, and of course, I want to do that at the same time as well, right? So I think that's that's how uh, I was, uh, I know, think about it, that past few years journey in the company. Eric, I think the future remains completely unwritten. This is uncharted territories for entrepreneurs in Malaysia, especially, right? And you're building something that is probably going to be a story for the lifetime of a lot of people who are going to be inspired by this, including people who will ultimately become the customer mafia, right? They go and they own their own startup that becomes its own sort of ecosystem and story to tell. So I'm not going to take out any more questions. We've got a lot. So I'm going to, I'm going to call. I think let's make it a bit more casual. Uh, I will call out your names. You'll come up so you can ask Eric in person because, hey, how often can you have a chat with Eric, right? So let's let's pick one by one. Cool questions. Okay, La, Maren, you've got this interesting question. Besides setting the vision and having OKR KPIs, how do you create a culture of taking risks, moving fast and personalization? So Maren, you want to you wanna add on to that or is that question good enough? You want to say hi to Eric? Hi, Eric. Um, I'm not sure whether you can hear me, but uh, yeah. yeah, okay. I can't uh, start on the video, but um, hi again, uh, Marin from Dr. Call. So, you know, um, I kind of uh, really inspired by, um, you know, the, the story and the journey that you've taken. And, um, you know, um, from my side, we're also going down a, a really fast trajectory, right? And uh, we, you know, on board, doubling up our team size uh, year on year. And I was kind of trying to understand from you, how, how did you actually create a culture, right? Where we, we don't want people to think in a homogeneous manner, but I just would like some of the key concepts of, you know, taking risk, moving fast, really think about the, the end customer uh, to be embraced by people across, you know, all our offices, whether it's in KL or across uh, the region. So how, how do you actually get that, that culture going in the organization? Yeah, yeah. I think first and foremost, we, um, the the people within the organizations need to be not afraid of making mistake, um, and and you need to have a culture to allow that right to happen. Like you know, by taking risks means that things might go wrong, um, and you need to be able to you know take mistakes right, the wrong decisions within the company. Um, but you know, while doing that, also making sure that it doesn't hurt uh, the company in a negative way. Um, right. You have you know, enough calculated risk to take on. And then you also have plans to reward back. And, and, and this is the saying of fail fast, you know, break things fast and, and just keep going, right? So, so I think ultimately once you allow that to happen, then, you know, people would be more um, 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 having a higher risk appetite, right? To, to, to right. try to think out of the box, to try to find breakthroughs in the company. And, and I think that's very important because the moment you find breakthrough, it means you move even faster. The company grow, grow exponentially. So, and, yeah. and oftentimes these are the ways that you can move the needers uh, in the company. Um, mm -hmm. but, but of course, also at the same time, not, not trying to uh, encourage a culture of making mistakes frequently. Um, yeah. it's, it's bad to make the same mistake again and again. So you just need to know like what kind of mistake that is, is worth making, right? Um, and, and then it helps you to shape into the decision-making uh, and the culture too. All right. Thanks, Maroon. Thanks, Thank for that question. Okay, I'm going to go to this. I like this part too. So I agree with Sudan here. When Eric said big bet versus big move, that's really, really cool. I'm going to put that on a poster somewhere, Eric. So Sudan, 
Would you like to open your camera and ask the question? I'm curious to see what's your either big bet or big move. I believe you're on mute, Sudan. Yep. Hello. Hey, guys. Um, my big bet that we're currently looking to do is basically to uh, acquire higher uh, stockists that, um, that is basically supplying the cooking gas to us. Um, we are currently doing about 15,000 refills. And um, this particular looking to retire stockist is doing about 250,000 refills a month. And uh, they have decided to basically retire and are looking to sell. And we basically proposed and uh, they have agreed to basically uh, sell their business to us. And we are currently, look, currently looking right now on how to value the business and basically complete the process of um, acquiring that particular stockist. Did you have a question or? Oh, oh, oh okay. So, so, so uh, our, on, our, on, on our part, the, 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 the problem that we face is how do you value that, you know, how, on, uh, on the, the business to acquire or how to, how do you value that, that uh, or, you know, buy over? That is the kind of questions that I, I'm, I'm not so uh, sure about on how to do that. So I think big move is is often being done in a sense in a in a sense where you need to understand what kind of uh, situation you're trying to create, right? Like like uh, a big move, for example, uh, in in the grab context is expand to 100 CDs in the next one year or 200 CDs because then I had the widest coverage when it comes to that or assemble the largest uh, drivers so that everyone can find a driver on the platform. Right, so that's a big move. So you work very hard in getting that happen um, faster than anyone in the market. So I, I guess coming coming to your point is you need to know whether you know how are you benefiting from this. You know, does this make your company a lot more unique, having that that mode built up or the competitive advantage? Um, and and then that, and then once once you have the understanding, then it becomes clearer to you whether this is a big move or big bet. Because if you're not sure the outcome, how how does it deliver that advantage to you? Then it's not really a big move. Because it, it doesn't help, right? Uh, that much as, as 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 clear as possible. So you need that objective to be extremely clear. That even say someone like as junior in your company will understand why you're doing that. Uh, that's a great, great. That's great. Great. Thank you. I, I really have to put uh, more thoughts on this. Thanks for yeah. the questions. Next question is uh, Lee from Elements. Are you here, Lee? If yeah, you yeah. Meet yourself. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Please go ahead and ask your question to to Eric. Please. Yeah, because uh, you mentioned in the beginning that uh, you have actually met us uh, around sixty investors, right? So uh, only one of them are interested. So uh, is it uh, uh, just curious? Uh, are all the sixty or fifty nine investors that rejected you uh, feedback the similar uh, feedbacks, and uh, how did you deal deal with it? <laughs> yeah. Sure. <clears throat> um. I think in the early days, especially because I, I, I'm not in the industry, right? So, uh, you know, people see there's no track record. Um, and obviously that also uh, was one of the key reasons why people would uh, reject an investment on Carson. Because uh, without a, a strong track record, of course, they wouldn't think that uh, you, uh, there's some hesitant, hesitant, they are hesitant in investing because of that, that whether I can scale the business or not. Um, but I think secondly, also because the market wasn't uh, as sexy back then. I think not that many people understand how a used car market is being operated in Southeast Asia. Um, and and um, um, in, in some way, my, my pitch back then wasn't really that refined as well. So that don't help, you know, uh, articulating a right, you know, narrative of what's happening in the used car market and how interesting is this opportunity. So I think these, these are, you know, the key reasons I would say in the beginning. So, so and, and it kind of just fine tune uh, over time, right? With every investment, every pitch that I go to, you, you kind of understand what is the, the, the resistance. Like, why, what, are, what are the reasons that they're actually not investing in you? Um, and I think instead of saying, like, why are these guys not investing in me? They don't understand my business, you know, they're stupid. I think you need to understand why they are not able to understand it as much as how you believe, you know, of, of in the company. Right, I think it's, it's very key that you are able to articulate your business model very clearly, the business idea very clearly to anyone out there, even a consumer, even a person that's not in the investment world. Right, I think that's 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 going to be that key. Right, that your your goal is to make this business 
to be known for as much people as possible, as many people as possible. And it's very easy for them to say that, what are you doing and why this is going to be a really interesting company. Um, and, and once you start working on those kind of uh, narrative and understanding, right, then you are also spelling it out for your, for your uh, investors in your pitches. And I think that it will help increase a lot of the, the, um, the conversion, right, of, of investors coming in eventually. Thanks a lot. Cool, I hope. Thanks a lot. Uh. Oh, that answers your question, Lee. <laughs> yep, okay, yep. next. So many questions to go through. Sorry, Eric. Today, you got to answer a lot of questions. Huh? <laughs> yeah, okay, next one. We, we'll go to this. This is interesting. We'll go to HR. So, Efren, would you like to unmute yourself and turn on your camera and say hi to Eric? Hi, Eric. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. I yep. can. Yep, yep. So, actually, this is uh, going back to the scaling up questions, right? So, so, so yours is quite is different from most of the SMEs. Lah. So a lot of, even a lot of startups, right? Well, we have our cadence to uh, set up our, you know, finance team, HR team. Uh, for our case, like we, we had our first accountant at 12 person, uh, first uh, HR at about 20-ish person. So, uh, but of course, uh, come back to your journey uh, because you, you were growing so fast, right? Uh, was the HR person an external hire or one of the co-founder or someone that's very close to you? How did you hire uh, the person? Um, when did the person join? Uh, at what stage? What is the role of the first person? Um, how important is the, the HR side of facilitating the entire growth and things? Because, uh, uh, of course, a lot of uh, HRs in the market, you know, they are not in the growth mindsets and things like that. Um, so, so then uh, th it's, it's very much uh, would, would like to hear your stories of uh, you know the, the life with HR did you ever fire any HR because of uh, their mindset is not a growth mentality or things like that thank you yeah yep. you're right you know um, I even myself didn't realize the importance of HR until like uh, towards like the second third or fourth year right so it was always that, that department that got overlooked. Um, and and I, I can tell you very frankly, because of how growth mindset is being embedded in most of the departments, HR is one that is one of the hardest to actually uh, make them to, to think along as well. So, and and I think, um, you know, it was only recent times that we hired a HR director that he's really strong at doing this. Um, you see that he's, 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 he's very uh, in tune with where the business is going, especially when you talk about growth mindset, it's something that he embraced a lot as well. Um, and I think the growth mindset comes to think, thinking about, you know, the next 12 funds, the headcount is going to grow to uh, X numbers. How do you handle that, right? And, and how do we uh, firstly recruit these people? How do we make sure that we, we have a culture and we can retain these people in the company and have a very low churn rate um, and ultimately also continue to... Uh, um, um, have more activities to be more engaged so that everyone in the company knows that what's happening. Um, and I think those communications has been something that you have to start from the highest level, right? That you're able to find someone that is uh, in line with that, that vision. Um, honestly speaking, we didn't find someone, we, we only found someone until like about uh, uh, end of 2019 that is really suitable in, in, on, on this role, growing the hash R function. Um, it has been something that we recognize uh, after two and three years in the business. Uh, after we also, at the same time, have about three, 400 people in the company, right? We started to realize that there's a lot of gaps uh, HRs are facing. Um, and I believe that you know that we are also a user of Paki Tangan, right? So, and that helped us to also streamline and take away some of this bandwidth. Um, and then the HR, you know, head will be more, more, more skewed towards uh, managing the whole communication piece, the culture building um, um, between, and recruitment also, right? So, and I think uh, that's, that's how, how we, we think about it. We, didn't, we took the hard way to actually learn, you know, only until we get to a certain stage that we know that, oh, we need the HR uh, director, a very strong one. Um, and only, only until like uh, 2019, we managed to hire someone like that. I mean... Thank, uh, Eric, thanks for mentioning us. Uh, um, so the, that, that means uh, at the early days of time, we are talking about HRs being a facilitator and actually a lot of, from, from how you describe it, it's like a lot of uh, growth mindset and the growth uh, functionality of hiring uh, rely on the business leaders. In, yeah, in, it's... In, and HR just facilitate, like, just, group, just follow. Uh, I think it's, 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 um, it's a department that provides the foundation for you to grow 
without having that that constants right at the back mm -hmm. that while growing you know you have high churn rate you have people who are disgruntled with the business and so on or, or even the, the departments kind of conflicts right so um i think ultimately we, we position it as you know everyone playing different role in the company you know like a football match a goalkeeper striker midfielder right so so they are the one that makes sure making sure that the foundation is there um, you're able to continue rely on them to recruit team members um, and retain them as well, uh, and and I think this 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 is something that is is very much growth mindset. You know that's where the whole OKR picture comes into uh, the 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 uh, the the way we uh, uh, um, uh, describe this to the the company to the people. They recruit because these people are essential for us to achieve that growth, right? Or how do they contribute and so on? You know, having that that uh, good culture building as well. At the same time, also help us attract more people organically, um, and and I think that's that's very a lot of vision building, a lot of goal setting um, that that helps you know them to understand uh, at the same time what what they're doing, even as a hatcher. Okay, yeah. thanks, Efren. So we, Thank we're you. moving to the last last two questions because we've got five minutes left. We'll move to Gokula, who has a question on scaling fast to acquire versus profitability. Gokula, if you could kindly un unmute yourself and. And ask Eric the question. Morning, morning Eric. Uh, good to connect again. Uh, so I have this very, uh, um, I can relate so much to your early days because we went to similar setup uh, in our first year or so. But I think uh, this whole thing about, okay, now that you think you are nearing PMF and you want to do uh, a scale, hyperscale, right? Uh, there's two, there's always these two uh, debates about scaling fast by burning cash so that when you have a large enough market uh, or consumer, uh, a cap, uh, captive consumer market, you can find different ways to monetize them. Uh, so it's a net negative uh, process versus trying to scale uh, by trying to be profitable. Now in the consumer play, I've not really seen really the ability to do both in the same time, which is hyperscale and be profitable. Like usually you burn to acquire, attract, and then you create the stickiness and monetize Next, what's your, your thought process since you deal with a lot of, uh, I mean, your, your target customers are consumers, right? Yep, yep. So I, again, I think it comes from the leadership team, right? Like uh, largely yourself and, and the people around you. So you need to first set a very clear target shape you know, where you're trying to get to. And the package is not just the company perspective, but also on the, on the financial perspective, the revenue, what are the costs involved, and how do you pull the levers in between, right? Um, and, and I mentioned about the big move earlier, it, it, it concerns with this because once you have the target ship, you know what levers to pull, uh, to, 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 to pull. it helps you to design a big move to be uh, uh, moving these levers. And then it comes back to that questions that you have, you know, whether should I burn money right now to scale this? Because you have a clear understanding of the target ship you're trying to reach to, how much money you're burning and, and, and how does it, you know, gets you to, to that uh, position, right, of like, say revenue, for example, of 100 million, 200 million. And then um, how, does, how, that, how does that define you in the market? Are you a market leader with that? Um, or, 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 or you are just, you know, second or you need to go even higher. Um, and, and if you look at Carson, uh, it feels like we are burning a lot of money to try to get to our goal. But in actual fact, it's not. If you if you look at our financials, right, we never burn more than twenty million a year. Our max max was about twelve to fifteen million on an annual basis. That's the cash that we burn in order to get us to where we are right now. So, a lot of this is really to understand that how we are trying to capture the growth, uh, and and what does it take for you to get there. So yes, it feels like it's burning, but ultimately, you see, if you're growing five x your revenue from 20 to become 100, your burn rate from five increase to 10, it's, it's, you're, actually, you're actually doing very well. Uh, it, it gets you faster to EBITDA and, 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 and you know, that's, that's how we think about uh, growing the business. Okay. Thanks, Gokula. Thanks. In the interest of time, we have to take a photo, right, Fira? All of us here, we've only got two minutes left, or actually one minute left. Uh, so Fira, you wanna, you wanna come on, yep. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, maybe just one more question, then we can we can close off. Okay, one more question. Okay, like extra time. Sorry, Eric. Extra time. Football match. So the last question we will pick from here is from Ag 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 Deep. Ah, you wanna unmute yourself, Deep? Is Deep still around? Calling once. Okay, then last one is from Malini. Then from Pegasus Security. Malini, you wanna unmute yourself and ask the question to Eric? 
Yep. Hi, Eric. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I really appreciate it. Very, very good learning. Uh, I've got actually two questions, one after another. So the, for the first one is for your first big investment into the business. Uh, was it VC led? Was it an angel investor? Uh, was it local or was it international? The second part to it is, did you already have profits that validated your idea as well as traction to show before you got that investment? Thank you. Uh, so I think uh, for the first one, it was mostly VCs. Uh, um, um, we have two investors that came in during the first round. One is uh, Idea River Run, um, the local VC. Uh, the other one is Founder Startups, uh, which, which you guys would be very familiar of as an investor. And then the second round, furthermore, you have Gobi Ventures, uh, Gobi Partners, um, you have Lumia, and you have like uh, Breda and so on. So there's a mix of uh, local and international. I would say more international uh, because, you know, part of the the, the challenges that we face in being a Malaysia company also is there's limited um, uh, investors that you can pitch to, right? Um, so, so I find myself being, you know, uh, traveling overseas and, you know, in, in during this time also doing Zoom calls uh, with investors across like different countries to, to different markets. Um, yeah, that, that's just how we uh, got an investment so far um, in the initial days, especially. So I think the second question was, um, is, did you already have profit that validates your idea? Is this the second question? Yes, yes. Yeah. So I think uh, we 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 are nev we're never EBITDA positive, right? If, if I look back in the past six years, but we've been always able to demonstrate the contribution margin of each and every uh, transactions that we do is easily the top one, two, uh, when we compare ourselves to the global comps. So, and, and that is why we are so efficient. We're very, very cost efficient in the way we get to the numbers that we are having today. Um, and there's always a way that we can demonstrate, you know, if today we do, we do want to stop investment, investing heavily in grabbing market share, in, in, in uh, growing the, the revenue, we would turn profitable very quickly. So it's a deliberate decision, right? That we were trying to go for another few more percent Five ten percent and trying to capture more, extend more services between one transactions, um, and grow the, the the spread of every transactions that we're getting. So, uh, I think we are clear about that. So, which makes this very profitable. So, and I think it's it's, it's just a, a matter of when you want to uh, pull the lever and, and 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 make it happen. Thank you. Thanks, Malini and Eric. Thank you so much for your time. We have gone two minutes past your time. I know you're a busy man. We're not going to take any more of your time. So I think, Fira, you want to take over and take a quick sort of snapshot, everybody, and uh, we can let everybody go. <laughs> if everyone can just turn on their cameras, uh, we'll take the picture now. First page, one, two. Second page, one, two. Okay, that's it. Um, Thank you so, so much for your time, Eric. Thank you. Hey, Thanks, no Eric. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Yeah, happy to be here. <clears throat> Just before everyone goes, um, the Blitz Cleaning Circle is something we do every bi-weekly. So for the next uh, event itself, we have Hendy Sationo from Indonesia, and he is the most inspiring uh, franchise leader in Indonesia itself. So, um, Abby, if you could share the screen. Yeah, it's only sort of Murphy's Law whenever screen sharing happens. So, okay, there you go. Fantastic, yeah. Okay, so there's a link in the Zoom chat if everyone wants to to sign up for the next uh, session itself. Um, essentially, we're going to speak about their scaling strategy in terms of uh, how do they scale the businesses. And before everyone go, the last thing that we want to do is a short survey. So if everyone can see in Zoom itself, um, there's a polling thing that will come out soon. So this will help us in terms of planning for the next event itself. Um, other than that, if you have any questions or if you want to reach out to Endeavor, if you're interested in Endeavor, feel free to reach out to us in any of our social media pages. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining the session today. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Ali. Thanks, Eric. Right. See you. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks, Eric. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. See you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Bye, bye. See you for the next session. Bye. Bye, man. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. That? Bye. Hey, thanks for the Endeavor team and the good interview, Adeline. Well done. Hey, thanks, Carol. Thanks, Carol. Okay, bye-bye. Yeah, I didn't know what was going on. Tanya, is that? Okay, next time, next time. Okay, is that? Bye, thank you.
Okay. So okay. gini. Uh, first saya nak Okey, okay, Izak, Izak, nanti I call you, I call you. Okey, okay, baik. I call you. Okey, okey, Izak. Okey. Hi, Sharon. Sharon wants to stay, is it? Yeah. Okay, lah. Hey, Sharon, how? Okay, yeah. Hey, you're mute, you're, you're mute, you're mute, bro. <clears throat> no, Eric's session, actually, actually, I must congratulate sure, you guys. I understand. This is good. And I think.